Hello, happy Thursday, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for this live episode. I'm very excited for the conversation we're gonna have today. Um, and weeks prior, I've been doing a lot of interviews with different platforms and different technologies to try and bring you new ideas. Um, great, I was just testing YouTube to make sure we are live and it is working. I always like to make sure the audio is up and that you can see me properly. Um, so first of all, let me know um, where you are tuning in from and please comment below and let us know and what organization you work for. Um, so as, as I was just mentioning while you kind of plug that in, um, the past couple of weeks have been a lot of technology and tools to better help you plan virtual events or end of year fundraising. And I think it's always helpful. I love learning from colleagues of mine. So I wanted to make sure to also represent other nonprofits that are doing incredible work that have our keyword this year, pivot, transition, all the things um, with programming and with fundraising. So please let me know as we go along if you have any questions. Today, you are gonna be hearing from two incredible people um, that both work with Coach Art. So Coach Art is an organization that I heard about when I lived in Los Angeles, and they create a transformative arts and athletics community for families impacted by childhood chronic illness. So really important work. And today we have Craig, uh, Greg, I don't know why I called you Craig. <laughs> Greg is the executive director for CoChart for the past four and a half years. So, so thankful to have him with us. And Leah is one of the co-founders of CoChart and also the founder of Every Purpose. So without further ado, here is Leah and Greg. So nice to have you both here. Thank you so much for having us. Of course, of course. So I would love a little bit of introduction um, for everybody, if you wouldn't mind, I guess, Greg, maybe let's start off first. Can you share a little bit about yourself and then also CoChart? Sure. Uh, Greg Her Harrell Edge, Executive Director of CoChart for the last four and a half years. Um, I've been in nonprofit for about 11 years now. Um, and when I first came on board at CoChart, uh, was just so blown away by the work that we do and really excited about the potential to be able to scale the organization using technology and using marketing to a lot more cities. And so that's what we've been on a journey to do the last four and a half years. Awesome. Amazing. And Leah, how about yourself? Hi, everyone. Um, so I am the co-founder of CoChart. Um, I started the organization almost 20 years ago with a very close friend, Xander Lurie. Um, it began my journey into the impact and nonprofit space. Um, I have worked with nonprofits for much of the past 20 years. Um, and now I run an agency called Every Purpose and I help small start uh, small growths. I help startups and early growth companies on building purpose into their business and their brand. Love that. Super, super important, especially with everything that's been going on this year, I'm sure. Yes. And Leah and I also connected actually Oh my gosh. It was like a couple years ago, right? Yeah. At the social innovation summit. That's right. When we could actually be in person. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Back forever then, that, ago. <laughs> forever ago in that very different world. So that's a great intro into kind of my, my first question. We're going to jump right in. When COVID first happened in March, really, it really happened for us in March. It sunk in. What events were you currently planning for that you had to figure out what was going to happen, I guess. And you can speak to events in kind of a broad sense as far as how your programming had to change. And then maybe also from a fundraising perspective too. Cool. I'll, I'll start. And then Greg, why don't you talk about the program pivot? Um, so one of the things that we always made a priority with at CoChart, we looked at it much more like a mission driven brand. Um, and we're always looking at how do we have control over our operating expenses. And so we developed a model that was very event heavy. We had one major benefit in the Bay Area um, and we had a huge gala in Los Angeles each year. Um, which was the majority of the funds. That way we had total control over our general operating, which has allowed us to invest in technology and really drive our strategy. Um, and so when th the San Francisco event was actually scheduled for the spring, and so we very quickly had to figure out 
what do we do? How do we create a virtual gala for this? What is going to be our fundraising strategy moving forward, knowing that 80 plus percent of our funds would come from our major events? So and when you say spring, what was that date of that event? What was it? Was it April 18th? Or I mean, I, Greg, I can't remember exactly, but it was, <laughs> it was very quickly after everything shut down in California. Um, and so it was it was a real moment for our board and our organization to say, how are we going to handle this? What are we going to do? Our board stepped up and provided a board fund separate that we have never done in order to help support our overhead and, and our costs. And then we really dove into virtual events. And I remember having a conversation with Greg and looking up virtual galas and things at, at, at that time in March, and there wasn't even anything on the internet. And now it's everywhere you look. So we moved really quickly. Um, and it was the beginning of our, our pivot to be a completely virtual organization. That's right. And I think, Greg, I don't know if you have anything to add to what Leah said, but I think when we met, it was a webinar workshop. And I think that was one of your questions um, was around virtual events at the time, because there were only a few, I think I remember the Washington Performing Arts had done a gala. They pivoted very quickly, but the difference for them was they did it in a couple of days. They already had all the tickets sold. They already had all the sponsors. So it was a lot different if you had something that was pretty much done and you just had to figure out how to switch your programming versus starting from scratch. Right. And, and we sort of had both where, you know, as Leah mentioned, we had these two big events. So our San Francisco event that takes place in April, we had sent out the invites. We had people who were signing up. So we had that version and, and about 40 some percent of our revenue comes from that event. So we had that version where we had already had it all scheduled and it was set. And what does the pivot look like? And then we were just starting the seven, eight month lead process for our LA event in the fall where another 40 some percent of our revenue comes from. So we were really trying to tackle both questions at once is what do you do with something that was already on the books and you've got it at the last minute, change it to something else. And then as we were just starting to talk about, what do you do when you're looking at the fall and saying, I, don't, I still don't know if 600 people are gonna be getting together in a room, how can we reimagine this concept from scratch into something that would be exciting and compelling for people to come to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to kind of piggyback off of that, from from your programming standpoint, I've seen you do some pretty creative things. How did you pivot in that sense and still making sure that you were able to support the people that you serve? Sure. So yeah, just as much as we were reliant on these in-person events for our revenue, our entire pro program model is getting groups of kids and groups of volunteers together for in-person arts and athletics activities and scheduling for one-on-one -on -one kids, you know, volunteers to go to a child's house, enter into their home and, you know, as, as uh, somebody, two strangers uh, to do lessons inside the home, things that are now virtually unthinkable. And so we were back to square one. So it was both absolutely terrifying, frankly, but also something that we very early on tried to identify as an opportunity. And we had become very kind of entrepreneurial in the way that we approached the organization for the last four years before that. And so that served us really well. I remember really early on, we were saying five years from now, there are probably going to be permanent improvements programmatically and fundraising wise that people look back and say that started because of the pandemic. So what are those going to be and how can we be out in front of them on both the program side and the fundraising side as quickly as possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, how, what would you say was the transition time period for programming? Really quick. So um, first of all, we started using video conferencing tools like this, and we just gave all of our uh, volunteers and students access to their own unique Zoom URL to be able to do programming. One of the most fascinating things that we found is, so we launched that in March. We gave it to a handful of volunteers and students and then made it widely available to every volunteer and, and student in April. And we actually saw a huge surge in lesson hours. People were home. They wanted something to do. In April, we had one of the highest lesson hour months we ever had, but our flash survey quality scores right after the lessons went down significantly for the first time that any of us could remember. 
So what we ended up seeing was immediately a surge that kept growing all summer long. We've continued to break all kinds of records for the volume of lesson hours, but we had a, a dip in quality right away that we started to solve for month over month. And I'm really proud to say that by July, we had the highest uh, volume that we were doing and the quality was back to the same quality scores that we were achieving before the pandemic hit. That's incredible. That's great. Congratulations. That's a big feat because Thanks. I know that's something where it's on both sides, there's learning happening, right? So it's from your perspective, you're trying to create the greatest experience. And then also from the participant side, they're trying to get accustomed to this is a new way of doing something. So it might be at first, I'm just uncertain about this new platform. And I think a lot of it is just learned experience, right? The more and more you do something, the more you get comfortable with logging onto Zoom, or we're using StreamYard today, and the first time might feel like hiccups, but then the more and more you get used to it, hopefully that helps also in um, the results in the survey happening afterwards too. Definitely. And like everybody watching, it, I think it definitely went from something that was new and fun for a lot of people to Zoom <laughs> fatigue really quickly. It was like, oh, this is neat. I've never tried it before. What a cool tool to within a few weeks. It was like, oh my gosh, another one of these. So how to keep it creative and fresh and new. Mm -hmm. Um, was and continues to be something that we try to think about all the time. Yes. Yeah. I mean, and I think that was one of the fundamental questions that our fundraising committee and our team at CoChart talked about over and over, which was how do we make sure that with people who are dealing with Zoom fatigue and f Zoom going on all the time or whatever video conferencing tool that they have, um, how do we keep it interesting, engaging, creative, and all of those things. So how do we get somebody after a long day to come to a virtual gala or to come to a salon or a fundraising event? Um, and that was is really one of the things I think, not only for our organization, but for so many nonprofits right now and so many organizations, how do you stand out? What are the right tools? Who is your target audience? You know, really thinking through some of those questions on a different level than you would for an in-person live event or for the events that you have done for the past number of years. And so, you know, I think those questions are really the big things moving into 20, the year end giving and into 2021, when you're looking at your virtual events and what tools are out there and what can make your event really engaging for your donors, what makes you stand out. Um, and those were some of the things that we played around with both in our first gala in June and then really um, took to another level for our October event. So in leaning into that big question, um, what were your sponsor reactions for June and then also for the fall? So you mentioned um, new tech and how to keep people engaged. How did you create new creative experiences for your sponsors within this new virtual setting? So we were really lucky. Uh, so many of our sponsors have been loyal for years and years and come from the amazing relationships that board members like Leah have with leaders in, at different companies. And so we've always said we think that these sponsors are supporting CoChart because of the work and because of the, the relationships with their board members and that being able to get together with friends one night a year helps, but that it's not the primary reason. But of course, this definitely put that to the test. It was like, let's really see. And we are really lucky to, to be able to, to look back and say so many of our sponsors said, yep, totally get it. Whatever you need, we're in for the same level. We're in for more. We had sponsors who sponsored at higher levels than they ever mm -hmm. had before. And it's so much due to their connection to our board members and those relationships and their connection to the actual work and the mission as opposed to the, the actual event itself. Love that. And I think I just had this question asked of me recently, actually yesterday. And so I love both of your responses to this. Someone asked me, should digital sponsorships be a different dollar amount, whether the event is in person or virtual? And I'll give you my response and I love your take on this answer. I said, absolutely not. It's based on what do you, what funds do you need for your programming or for your operational expenses? Because what you're doing doesn't change. You still need those funds to be able to execute the work that you're doing. And it just might be how those funds are allocated are different. For instance, like with your programming, now you're having to purchase probably Zoom subscriptions or something versus what you did with purchasing a physical event space. But no matter what 
the costs are, they're still there. So my response was no. Um, to your point, hopefully the relationships are there and they care about the mission and the impact of your work. And whether you're sitting at a table in a space or you're sitting on your couch watching a presentation, the dollar amount shouldn't matter. What What do you both think? Yeah, I mean, you know, now more than ever, actually, the work that we're all doing, I mean, I know for Coach Art especially, but for so many organizations is as important, if not more important, because of what's going on in the world. And so just because things are different, just because we are doing things virtually versus in person, you're right, the, the allocation of funds may switch to different tools, but meeting your mission in the way, the most efficient and effective way is still the primary goal. And so, you know, for really being able to communicate that to your sponsors, the work that you're doing, why this is still so important now, probably more important than ever, especially because for a lot of organizations that maybe are not dealing with frontline workers or COVID issues or some of the major things going on in the news and in the press right now, all of these issues are still existing. And so how do you find, you know, those tools? How do you really figure out how, what that story and that narrative is with your sponsors to go back to them and say, we are still addressing these issues. We're still working with this population. We, we're we still here and we want to survive and thrive. And you're an important part of that for us. Absolutely. One thing that I've been suggesting is Traditionally, we have our sponsor decks, right? Or a one pager that lists presenting sponsor, gold, silver, bronze. And normally they're like, I'm making up these numbers, right? But 50K, 20K, 10K, $1,000, whatever. And you get X tables and you get your logo in this place. And instead I'm challenging organizations to restructure your sponsorship decks and your ask to be equal to your impact goals. So have that instead of 50K, maybe it's $45,950. And that equals 25 kids to receive monthly program arts programming. Or maybe this dollar amount allows us to hire a social media manager because now we're dealing with online services, right? So it's breaking down instead of, and then you can also say, yes, this will also get you X, Y, and Z within our virtual program. But first and foremost, launching with an impact goal sense. I 100% I agree. And I think, you know, ultimately we don't choose how much money a sponsor is gonna give any of us. It's the sponsor right. is still gonna choose. So absolutely focusing on having the same range of options, but as we've been talking about, making the most compelling, inspiring ask that you can of this is why this gift matters right now more than ever before. And they're gonna choose what they're gonna choose you know, and be that smaller, the same, or sometimes more, regardless of what we put on the menu. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And, um, and I think one, one more thing really quickly on that is that I think in this moment in time, donors and sponsors are really wanting transparency and authenticity in terms of what is going on and what they're helping to support. And so, you know, I think it's less percent. about the program page and things like that and more about this is where it's going. And then here's how we're going to include you in our virtual event. And here's how we're going to communicate that out to our networks. And so, you know, whether it's having a, a virtual overlay tool that allows you to have your sponsors kind of come up on the screen, like in this setting, yeah. um, whether it's the ability to start to partner with them, tag them in your social and build up and your marketing and promotions. It, you know, the, the idea is the same in that relationship, but there are a lot of new tools that you can use, especially in your live stream and your virtual event to be able to give them that recognition, um, but not necessarily have to do it in the way that it was done before. Exactly. Okay. That's a great transition point, actually, because I wanted to ask you for June event in your October event. And I know, Craig, you have a, um, Craig, you have an example of kind of a presentation you utilize and Leah and I have some research on Pledgling too. Can you talk about kind of the tools and the platforms that you did some research on and why you picked the ones you did? 
Yeah, so um, Pledgling is, is an online fundraising platform. And one of the things that they did as well, it, it's a small startup company in Los Angeles, is immediately when COVID occurred, they started to think about this exact issue of how can we increase fundraising to organizations through a virtual setting? And they started to collaborate with Zoom on building out a virtual donation overlay that can be embedded in any Zoom meeting, webinar, or live stream event. Um, and it is really one of the first tools where organizations can have their don't live donor feed reflected. You can have donor names reflected. You can have a free mobile optimized text to give. That's literally a two click mobile, either Apple Pay, Google Pay, you know, straight into your event. And so when we were looking, when we have in our June event, we watched, we saw how much we had raised with sponsors and outside before. And then we obviously did an appeal and a, a live call to action during the event. And then we knew in our October event, we were stepping up not only who our honorees were in terms of their experience, you know, their their reach and their influence and their networks. And so we really wanted to find a, a donation tool where people didn't have to leave the live stream right. event to go, to go to an external site. And Pledgling is one of the only um, tools right now that not only does that, but then connects it to their entire suite of donation pages. They immediately send tax receipts to all of your donors. You can get access to all that information. Everything happens real time and it's free to nonprofits. And so, you know, the idea that nonprofits can experiment with this, use it in their virtual events and fundraising, you know, obviously knowing that there's a lot of other platforms that people have used for a very long time, but they can use it without necessarily having to invest a ton of money in it and see how it works for different types of events, small events and salons, all the way up to the gala that we had, which was a couple hundred people logging in. And we raised over a hundred thousand dollars in 30 minutes using that tool. Amazing. That's incredible. And I think, um, Greg, do you want me to showcase your screen share here? And we can sure. kind of share what Leah's yeah. talking about. Yeah, so I've got a couple of seconds that I can show you. I'll, I'll walk through it really quickly. So what you're seeing here, so we worked with a company called Sparks Technology to build a live stream for us. So that's what you're seeing here is custom built where there's a chat over on the right. You can see our speakers there. So as Leah mentioned, we did this um, at our first event uh, and we raised $50,000 in donations. People would click the donate button and they would go off site to our typical donation page. And we raised $50,000, we were thrilled. That's about what we raise in the room at our standard events. Then this is our second event and I'll, I'll hit play in a second where we use the pledgling overlay, doubled that amount that was raised. So people wow. didn't have to go anywhere. They could text or they could give right through their phone while they were watching the show. And then the gifts would show up in the total that was overlaid on the screen. And that level of engagement led to over $100,000 raised. This is coming from the middle of the show. So the number's not quite so high, but I'll press play right now. Tonight, we're partnering with an amazing new online event tool from Pledgling that automatically adds every donation you make tonight, either by text or by clicking the donate button to the total on the screen. Oh my gosh, we're already above $53,000 with individual donations that have come in so far. And we'd like to tell you about what your gift would support at each level. Rather than just listing the benefits, <sighs> We want to show you one photo that represents each level as well. For the $10,000 level, our accompanying photo is one of our first ever New York City students with her paint ready to go. This level funds the launch costs of Coach Art's virtual programs in a new city. So <clears throat> that gives you a little look at the, the platform itself. And then also one of those things that we were talking about earlier, the idea of very much tying the individual donation right. level to these very specific and ambitious programmatic growth goals that I think is another critical part of it. So were you question on just what we're looking at from a mm -hmm. functionality of how somebody is involved? So is this the Spark, is it Spark or Sparks? Sparks. Sparks. Is this a platform that for everybody to participate in the chat, are they logged into something or is this kind of like a social experience where this is this whole thing is a live stream. 
So it's on our website. So they would go to uh, coachart.org slash salute to coaches. You would click, uh, you know, it went live on the night of the event. Up until then, you could pre-register, but then you would be able to go live. You would click in and you had a choice. You could view it as a guest. And we would explain this at the top of the show where you couldn't interact with the chat feature and some of the other functionality, or you could log in in the top right here. And so this is logged in as one of our team members who's uh, tracking along. So then you're able to use the chat, uh, use the, the donate functionality and have your name pop up and all of that good stuff. Gotcha. So all of this could be customized. You you were able to have obviously your logo in the bottom left-hand corner, the purple background, everything about this. It, could you have, I see the Twitter feed going on the left-hand side. You could change that to something else if you wanted to. Absolutely. And then this bottom right box, you might have seen it change, but we had different things that would, I mean, bottom center. We had, before the event started, we had arts and athletics trivia that would pop up that people could interactively answer. FAQs about coach art, uh, you know, the donation appeal would pop up from time to time. And so we did all of this on the custom build Sparks platform, which Pledgeling was able to integrate with, but they just as easily can integrate with Zoom if you're hosting your event there or Facebook Live if you're hosting your event there. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to have to look this up. Is Sparks, is it a white label solution or is it something where you work with somebody on their team to put together? Work with somebody on their team, or at least that's what we did um, okay. to do a, a custom build live stream for this event. Great. So it was, think of the AV production team you would use in a live event. We engaged a, essentially a digital production team to help ensure one, that this was done safely and securely for all of our donors and our guests, mm -hmm. that it went extraordinarily smooth in terms of IT and technology, that we were able to pre-record and lo do live features, and that we could integrate the, do the virtual donation overlay and tools to really engage guests and audiences, to keep them there, to have them stay throughout the show, um, and to really get them engaged. And you know, the, the live chat on the side is one of the most, of effective tools to drive fundraising dollars, as well as just for the energy. I mean, it, it sort of makes it feel like you're in the room. You see your friends, you're chatting, you're talking about it. People are challenging donations. Um, and so I think, you know, that coupled with being able to see, we chose not to have the individual names of donors pop up on our, our screen. Um, but that is a choice if you use the pledgling overlay is that you can literally see it could be anonymous or you can see people's names. And again, that's something that can that can be customized depending on the kind of event that you use. But, you know, the Pledgeling tool works on any um, any live stream platform that uses a virtual camera. So Twitch and YouTube and, as you said, Zoom and Facebook Live and, and all of these different outlets. Um, and so amazing. It's, yeah, I even had a phone conversation with them and you can use it on StreamYard. Oh, oh wow. Cool. Because it's essentially just adding a different yeah. camera. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one other thing I would add quickly, sort of budget wise. So Leah mentioned the AV at a, at a hotel where we usually do events. So Sparks was about half of what the cost is for just the AV that we usually do at hotels. So total savings. So 50% savings there, right. total savings on the room itself, the food, the, the wine, all of that. So all in all, the cost of this event was a fraction. Pledging, of course, free to use, which is incredible. Um, so the event overall uh, was a fraction of the cost of what our hotel galas typically are. Um, and so we were really thrilled with that result from both sides of it. That's great. That's an amazing point to bring up is that you don't have to have the expenses that you normally would have to still put on a very high quality produced event. And in the center, I noticed, obviously, because she was reading off the numbers in real time, did you have pre-recorded and live components to your production? Yes, we had live co-hosts who then would cut to pre-taped performances and things like that. Got it. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then I would say, I know we are going to wrap here shortly. I would love to, from both of you to hear what is one piece of advice from your experience in these two events? I know there's a ton of conversations that you've probably had, whether it has to deal with sponsors, board of directors, programming to facilitating a virtual event. Um, Leah, I'd love to start with you. 
I think one, really start off by setting your goals and knowing your target audience, which will help you define what kind of virtual event makes sense. Um, once you do that, really identifying the virtual event platform. So is it a StreamYard? Is it a live stream? Is it a Zoom? What is the most effective tool for what you want to accomplish? And then finding a partner like a Pledgling, your online fundraising suite of tools to make it as easy as possible on to manage the event. And then the last thing really is treat it exactly the same way you would treat a live event. You need timelines, you need budgets, you need to have your board engaged, you know, you need a marketing and an outreach plan, you need a run of show. I mean, you know, even though it is not in person, the more details you can have, the more thorough your pre-event planning, your prep for any troubleshooting as well as the run of show during the event, the more successful it will be. Um, and then last, I would say, keep high quality and keep it short, just because yes. there are so many compete pe things competing for your guests' attention. Um, and so, you know, really think about every single minute and how quickly you can get done what you need to get done. It's a great piece of advice. I have a virtual event run a show template I will put in the comments after this wraps, but that's a great piece of advice. Greg? I think my piece of advice to everyone would be stay innovative. That, that I think the bar of what attendees expect for these virtual galas, they were brand new this year. We had a lot of wiggle room in the spring, but the bar is going to keep rising and it's on us to stay innovative and stay creative and really start, start with a whiteboard and start with what is something about our work and our mission that's going to make people want to tune in and see what's going on? That they're not that that the bar to keep people getting people showing up and keeping them paying attention to what you're doing is getting higher and higher. And we've really got to keep thinking through how we pr uh, pr deliver the highest value and the most engaging content that we can to keep people engaged with our work. So so important. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways there is. Also, how can you think about creating an interactive participation? Because so often we're all in meetings all day long or presentations where we're being talked at. And when there's a chance to, because life is so different and a lot of times normally at a galley, and if you have kids, you have a babysitter and so you leave and you go. But in this circumstance, the kids are home with you. So mm -hmm. is there an experience that you can involve your kids with you so they can watch with you and they can learn about the organization and they can learn how donations happen and being um, and learn about philanthropy. And so I think innovation is so important. There are so, I feel like every single day I'm hearing about a new virtual event platform <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to yeah. do research on. So it's important to stay active and keep looking at what's coming out there because there's always, there's always somebody innovating to try and create something better, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think one thing for nonprofits out there, um, N10, the nonprofit technology network is going to be publishing right after the holidays, a, vir a nonprofit virtual event guide, almost like a workbook um, for you to think through all every stage of doing your virtual event and your fundraiser. A lot of the things that Coach Art has incorporated this mm -hmm. year, um, but that will be a free resource on the N10 website in December. Um, so just as you're looking at your end and as you're looking at 2021 event planning, just a great thing for you to have with your team, for your team. Awesome. Thank you both so much for your time, um, for your innovation in this space and for continuing just to be a great example for other nonprofits to look at. And of course, um, is there somewhere that they can reach either of you if they have questions? Yeah, um, just Leah at everypurpose.co. I'm going to put this in the comments. Leah, everypurpose.co. Yeah. And coachart.org, Greg at coachart.org, if you want to get more, more involved with Coachart's work. Um, but yeah, Leah really is an expert in the overall nonprofit sector and, and uh, has great wisdom and advice on the broader uh, mm -hmm. everything that's going on across all nonprofits. And Dana as well. I, I just picked her brain last week for our third and final virtual event that's coming up on December 1st. We're doing a Facebook Live, uh, Facebook Live Giving Tuesday live stream. Uh, featuring a bunch of influencers nice. for the first time. That's our new twist on oh, the yeah. virtual 
circumvent uh, our model. But um, yeah, I was just getting some useful tidbits from her last week on how we structure some of that. Yes, I'll definitely need to tune in. Yeah, yeah I'm excited. Do. I'm excited to see how people are going to be creative this Giving Tuesday. Yeah, it's going to be it's really gonna interesting. Be, yeah, it's going to be a, a fascinating array of entertainment and engagement and competition. And also, you know, <laughs> it's, we, it's really we want- up in the ante, I think, for every organization. And I guess the other thing I would say is, but don't feel intimidated um, if you know you don't have a huge budget for production or you haven't really thought about it. I th- again, coming back to that message, your donors want to know off- what is going on and what do you need. And if you can clearly and succinctly mm. communicate that to your donor database, that is the most important thing right now. And so be authentic, have a really great subject line in your outreach and just Keep it simple if you don't have something big scheduled or planned, that that it's still just about helping to meet your mission. And if they care about it, they will support you. Yeah. If I could throw in, sorry, I know we're over, one, one last cliffhanger for the event coming up. So we matched a bunch of influencers with Coach Art Kids. Um, magician David Blaine worked with one of our coach art kids who aspires to be a magician when he grows up. And when he no found way. out he got to do, when he found out he got to do a one-on-one with David Blaine, his dad said he got choked up and he was like so excited for it. <laughs> and so on December 1st, you'll be able to see their actual lesson working together and some of the magic tricks that he taught him. So I couldn't help myself. That's a little uh, hanging yeah. hanger plug for the uh, coach art event. That's event. incredible. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. Oh my gosh. I feel like I can keep talking. I have so many more questions, even since you just, <laughs> Message, or since you just said that, um, but we'll have to save that for a whole separate conversation about how to approach and work with influencers and talent yeah. within your nonprofit. I think that is a, a next kind of Q and A session. We can come back and tell you how it went afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Amazing, Leah, Greg, thank you so much for your time, um, you and I can't wait to hear what happens on Giving Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. That was incredible. I'm always so thankful and appreciative of anybody who comes on to kind of share their knowledge and wisdom with all of you. So please, if you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments. And I promise I will keep looking back at them. This session is recorded. We are live streaming on my Facebook group, um, Facebook channel and YouTube page. So at any given time, this will still remain live and I will send it out in an email blast. And I'll try and also put some links to if they're available to Coach Arch's virtual events so that you can kind of see, um, again, the platform that they were utilizing and how that functionality works, along with a link to how on Zoom and Pledgeling work together. Um, just some more information. Um, but with that said, thank you, thank you everyone for joining in and I hope you have a great rest of the week and I will not be doing a live stream next week. So happy Thanksgiving. Um, hope everybody has a healthy, fun and safe holiday with their friends and family. Thanks everyone.